In the last two weeks, we've had some pretty hard-hitting sermons, if you please. They've been sort of, you know, those crunchier type of messages. And I thought that today we needed more of a drawing, more of a, um, a heartfelt message, if you please. And so that's what we're talking about today. Today, we're going to be talking about tears. What do they teach us? It's been said that the measure of one's soul is the things that make us weep. Tears, as we'll find out, can be very selfish things. Or indeed, they can be some of the most saintly things. Tears can be very genuine, and tears can be very artificial. If you've ever watched a movie where there was some kind of a dramatic scene where people were crying and you find, you know, how do they make them cry so good? Well, I learned this week. You see, they have these things that look like a, a tube of lipstick. And it has like a menthol kind of thing that put, they put it under the person's eyelid and the vapors come up. And, and it's so irritating, it makes you cry, it makes you swell up and puffy. You look just like you're, you're crying. And then they have another one that's a little different, but they actually put up to the person's eye and blow through it into the eye and it, and it blows some of this mist or this, this, these chemicals into their eye. And, and just in a minute or two, you'd just be crying away like everything was really terrible. But what about tears? Can we learn anything about them, maybe about ourselves and about God? I want to look at tears today. The first thing I want to do is look at some tears that we might just simply call selfish tears. Some of the first tears ever mentioned in the Bible are in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 38. You remember that Isaac was going to give the birthright to Esau, but Jacob swindled him out of it. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. But was he crying, friends, because he had lost the great privilege of the birthright for spiritual reasons or for economic reasons, for prestige reasons? It wasn't because Esau wanted the spiritual birthright that he was so sorrowful at all. The Bible speaks about the children of Israel and how they lusted after flesh. Remember? In Numbers chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? By the way, what a wonderful lesson in being careful about the company you keep. Who began this murmuring and complaining? The mixed multitude. But their murmuring got Israel to murmuring, murmuring, and Israel actually began to weep. Continuing in verses 10 through 13. Numbers 11, verses 10 through 13. It says, Then Mer Moses heard the people, what? Weep. Throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. Verse 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Verse 12. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the suckling child, unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. Well, James says that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and Moses at times was also. Moses says, I can't understand this, Lord. These people, they're weeping, they're, they're crying, they want this flesh. How can you give me this burden to take care of them? Going on to verse 18. Numbers 11, 18 through 20. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against to tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, 
until it come out at your nostrils and it be loathsome unto you? Because ye have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? He says, I'm going to let you have it. You're going to have so much, you're going to get sick of this stuff. But they're weeping. It wasn't a saintly, godly, sorrowful weeping. It was the epitome of selfishness. In Judges, we have Samson's first wife. And she's mentioned, remember Samson had given a riddle and uh, the, the people couldn't solve his riddle. And so they, they complained to his new wife, you know, get him to tell us what the riddle is. And she just, you know, moaned and whined and begged and complained to him and says, and Samson's wife wept before him and said, thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and has not told it to me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him and she told the riddle to the children of her people. And of course, it, it really caused a lot of problems, if you remember. And eventually caused eventually caused her death. And so can you imagine? This is the time of the wedding. This is the wedding festivities, and everything's supposed to be happy and gay, and instead of being happy and gay, she's weeping and crying for seven days to him. It got to him, and he didn't like it. The Bible tells us about David. When he had sent his men out to war in the wilderness against Absalom and his soldiers. And when he learned that Absalom had been killed, it says in 2 Samuel 18, 32, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And even this saintly king wept some very selfish tears. And even the hardened Joab said, if you don't go down and, and wipe your face and stop this and go down and greet your men, they're going to rebel against you and you won't have anything. And David took the advice and did it. He was certainly upset with Joab for killing his son. But Joab was right in that case. David should not have wept. It was wrong for David to weep for this rebel. rebel. Another time that we read about this kind of weeping, in a sense, by a king, is about Hezekiah in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 20, and verses 1 through 3. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, that, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. You know, if he was really walking so closely with God, he would have said, your will be done. Okay, I get it. My time is over. But he wept sore. And we know that he was wrong because in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 25, it says, But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefits done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. He says, You know, I've served you with a perfect heart. He was really one of the first Laodiceans. He was one of the first Laodiceans. He really thought that he was rich, increased in goods, in need of nothing, but he didn't understand that he was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Fortunately for Hezekiah, he accepted the remedy. But those tears were not the right kind of tears. Other tears found in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. Here we find women weeping for Tammuz. It says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women 
weeping for Tammuz. Remember, Tammuz was a false Christ. He was a false son, the son of the sun god who had, had, had died. And they're weeping for Tammuz. So the Bible illustrates to us how we can pray all we want, but, and we can weep all we want, like, like Esau did. But if it's from a selfish motive, it avails us nothing, friends. It avails us nothing. So let's talk about some other kinds of tears now. Peter. Peter wept some tears. Do you remember? Jesus had told Peter, you know, do you really love me? I'll, I'll, I'll die for you, Lord. He says, no, you're going to deny me thrice before the cock crows twice tonight. Peter said, I'll never do that. I'll die for you, Lord. But we know that he did deny the Lord just as he said. And in verse 26, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 75, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which he had said, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Now, interestingly, the uh, Greek word that we translate bitterly here is uh, pikros, pikros, and it means mental anguish, particularly pertaining to feeling mental anguish. I mean, he was just tore up inside. He wept bitterly about this. In the book Education, on page 89, we are told that when in the judgment hall the words of denial had been spoken, when Peter's love and loyalty awakened under the Savior's glance of pity and love and sorrow, had sent him forth to the garden where Christ had wept and prayed, when his tears of remorse dropped upon the sod that had been moistened with the blood drops of his agony, then the Savior's words, I have prayed for thee, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, were a stay to his soul. Christ, though foreseeing his sin, had not abandoned him to despair. Maybe some of us have at times backslidden or we've committed some really terrible thing, some terrible sin. And we just feel terrible about it. We, we, we have remorse and repentance later. But we need to understand that Christ, just as in Peter's case, he foresaw our situation. He knew what was going to happen. But he is not abandoning us to despair. Not at all. Not at all. Now we're living in perilous times today. We're living in perilous times not only in the uh, circle of, of the sphere of this earth and the nations, but even of the church things. And in the book of Joel, in Joel chapter 2, Joel writes about a crisis happening among his people in his time. And he says here in verses 15 through 17, this which fits prophetically for us today. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? He says that there is a time and a place to weep, as it were, between the porch and the altar to weep right in the heart of the work of God and for the work of God. The, uh, the prophet Jeremiah was, has been nicknamed by some the weeping prophet. In Jeremiah 9 and verse 1, he says, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. They were slain for their sins, for their sins. Do we have a care for the cause of God, a care for the people of God, a care for the people who should be the people of God but are walking away from God, that we weep and pray for them? I think about the tears of Mary. I think about the tears of Mary. And... Um, Outside of the tears of Jesus, perhaps the most beautiful tears in the Bible. 
In Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 38, we read a little bit of the story. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went unto the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. This is one of the few uh, incidences in the life of Christ that is recorded in all four Gospels. It's in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12. Jesus said that wherever this gospel is preached, that what she has done will be spoken of as a memorial for her. And the very fact that it's in all four gospels speaks heavily toward that. We are told that this deed of love lifted up the spirits of the Savior. Mary wept tears because she realized that she was a deep, great sinner, saved by greater grace, and saved by grace alone. This woman was the last to leave the cross. She was the first to reach the empty tomb, and the first to proclaim a risen Savior. Her tears, her tears were genuine. You know, Jesus at this time told a story, a, a parable. And he ultimately came down and says, who's going to love the most? And, 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 and Simon says, well, the one who is forgiven the most. I don't know that Mary actually sinned more than me or you. But she understood the depths of her sin. She understood the depths of her forgiveness, and she appreciated it. I tell you, she appreciated it. In Revelation chapter 5, we have a story here now a picture, a, a panorama of something happening in heaven. And John writes in verse 1, Revelation 5, verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereon? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. Verse 4, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. John was so interested in the work of God. Here is this scroll. Still with seven seals. He knows there's something significant about this. He knows it needs to be opened. But there's no one found who's worthy to open it. And he weeps for the cause of God. But he says, the angel says, don't need to weep because the line of the tribe of Judah can do this. Christ. Jesus Christ. That's right. This, this, the right hand of him that's on the throne, going back to Revelation 3, 1, that's the Father. And Christ comes to the Father, and he receives this seal. William Miller, in his works, volume 2, page 189.1, we have a record here of one of his appeals. And he says, And now, my dear friends, what say you? Have you wept much to know whether your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Weep not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And he says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Therefore rejoice, because your names are written in heaven, says the dear Savior. Those people who heard William Miller I mean, honestly, I guess you wouldn't even have to hear him. If you just go back and read some of his sermons. But the people who heard him, they, they could sit spellbound an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, 
and no one dared move because he preached with such an intensity, such a, such a, a, a love for the people. He wanted them to be saved, and he would make these appeals, appeal after appeal after appeal, that the people would find Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now, I said Mary, I think, had the second sweetest tears, right? Who would, of course, have the most greatest tears of all? Jesus Christ. Now, it's true that when they were in Sabbath school one time and they were asking all the children to memorize one verse for the next week, someone chose John 11, 35. Two verses, two, two words in one verse, Jesus wept. Remember the story, though? Jesus had come to the tomb of Lazarus and the people were weeping and wailing and it says that Jesus wept. But I want you to notice some of the comments that Ellen White makes about this in The Tsar of Ages. Page 533.4. But it was not only because of his human sympathy with Mary and Martha that Jesus wept. Now let me just pause there for a minute. It was not only because of this that he wept. So part of his weeping was because even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus, he saw at that moment how Mary and Martha were hurting. And he hurt with them at that point. I guess it's been about 20 years ago, around 20 years ago, my son Hans was diagnosed with a type of brain cancer. And I remember talking to Sean Tilly at, uh, at his parts place, which is not where his current place is, but his wife Kathy was there and I hardly knew Kathy and I was explaining what had happened. And as Kathy heard about Hans' situation, she just started crying just started crying because she was so touched by the, the hurt and, and, and the difficulty that my son was going through. You know, and I, I tell you, I can't tell you what it did for me. I can't tell you what it did for me. But she says here, it was not only because of his human sympathy with Mary and Martha that Jesus wept. In his tears, there was a sorrow as high above human sorrow, as the heavens are higher than the earth. Christ did not weep for Lazarus, for he was about to call him from the grave. He wept because many of those now mourning for Lazarus would soon plan the death of him who was the resurrection and the life. And then continuing on page 334 in paragraph 1, the retribution that was coming upon Jerusalem was plainly portrayed before him. He saw Jerusalem compassed by the Roman legions. He knew that many now weeping for Lazarus would die in the siege of the city, and in their death there would be no hope. Today we, we, we see death. We sit with those who are dying sometimes. But yet we have hope. We have hope. But can you imagine the tears of, uh, of seeing someone die now and you know that they have no hope? That is a sadness. Continuing in Desire of Ages 354.2, it was not only because of the scene before him that Christ wept. The weight of the grief of ages was upon him. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. He saw that in the history of the world, beginning with the death of Abel, the conflict between good and evil had been unceasing. Looking down the years to come, he saw the suffering and sorrow, tears and death that were to be the lot of men. His heart was pierced with the pain of the human family of all ages and in all lands. The woes of the sinful race were heavy upon his soul and the fountain of his tears was broken up as he longed to relieve all their distress. Friends, sometimes you're crying and you think, does Jesus understand me when I cry? Well, friends, he understands us. He understands us so well. He knows what it means to cry with the greatest of sorrows. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, Jesus, as he was coming to Jerusalem 
during that last great week of his passion. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. But she would not. In Desire of Ages on page 620, paragraph 1, it says, Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then upon his hearers in a voice choked by deep anguish of heart and bitter tears. He exclaimed, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings and ye would not? This is the separate struggle in the lamentation of Christ. The very heart of God is pouring itself forth. It is the mysterious farewell of the long-suffering love of the deity. The love of the deity. The farewell love of the deity being poured out. And then notice this expression from Great Controversy, page 17, paragraph Two, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Luke 19, 41. Amid the universal rejoicing of the triumphal entry, why palm branches waved. Remember, they, 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 they cut those palm branches down to lay before him, and that was, that was an emblem, emblematic of victory. The people are crying Hosanna as the palm branches are going down. It's just like, it's, it's a wonderful, festive time for the people. It's great. Amid the universal rejoicing of the triumphal entry, why palm branches waved, why glad hosannas awoke the echoes of the hills, and thousands of voices declared him king. The world's redeemer was overwhelmed with a sudden and mysterious sorrow. He, the Son of God, the promised one of Israel, whose power had conquered death and called its captives from the graves, was in tears, not of ordinary grief, but of intense irrepressible agony. Jesus was just weeping in a way that, he, you know, he couldn't stop. It was irrepressible agony that he was going through. And then on the next page, page 18, paragraph 1, and I have it broken up into two parts here. It says, His tears were not for himself, though he well knew whether his feet were tending. Before him lay Gethsemane, the scene of his approaching agony. The sheep gate also was in sight, through which for centuries the victims of sacrifice had been led, and which was to open for him when he should be brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah 53, 7. Not far distant was Calvary, the place of crucifixion. Upon the path which Christ was soon to tread must fall the horror of great darkness as he should make his soul an offering for sin. Yet it was not the contemplation of these scenes that cast the shadow upon him in his hour of gladness. No, foreboding of his own superhuman anguish clouded that unselfish spirit. He wept for the doomed thousands of Jerusalem because of the blindness and impentance of those whom he came to bless and to save. Now, is, is Jesus our example? Yeah. Are we to model ourselves after Christ? Mm -hmm. You know, why can't we weep saintly tears like this? Why do we have a, such a hard time weeping for humanity as a whole, the starving, the sick, the homeless? Or what about the individuals, our neighbors, or perhaps even a family member who's in need? Why don't we care for individuals with this deep kind of compassion? Maybe it's because we are so interested in ourselves. Maybe. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, Jesus says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Of course, it won't gain anything for us, will it? But sometimes I fear, maybe many times, we just don't have time for others. We are so busy. Yet Christ, the majesty of heaven, he has made time for us. We are told that all of heaven was emptied in the gift of 
Christ. He didn't count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. I do believe, though, that many of us do care. Many of us do care. But at the same time, there is a part of our spirit that has been desensitized by the world and the things that we see around us. The killing, the violence, the disrespect and tragedy, both real as reported in the news and fictitious as seen in the movies and novels, they have calloused us and caused us, in a sense, to lose our grip on reality. You know, you think about some of the movies that young children even watch that exemplify murder and violence. And, and, and the children, they become desensitized. But we do too. But we do too. And we need to cultivate our minds, friends, to dwell on the pure and the holy so that we can have sensitive, caring hearts. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's what we should be thinking about. That's where our minds should be, not in some gutter somewhere. In Isaiah 33 and verse 14, we have a question asked here. He says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? That's the question. And he gives the answer now in verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Friends, we just can't keep imbibbing in the evil of this world and expect to dwell in devouring fire. It will not and cannot happen. We need to have the appreciation of what Jesus has done for us, like Mary did. Her life stands tall as an example of what a heart of appreciation of Christ can do for someone. Again, remember, she realized that she was forgiven much. Maybe we just haven't really looked closely enough into that perfect law of liberty, into that mirror to reflect to us the character of God, and yet at the same time show us our own sinfulness well enough to the point that we understand just how vile we are. I, I told this story once or twice, maybe, and it's easy to tell now that Anne's not here. But many years ago, Anne and Glenn were talking, and Anne said something to Glenn to the effect of, well, you know, we're really not selfish people, are we? <laughs> and, you know, Glenn, <laughs> Glenn said, oh, my land, we're just, we're just so full of covetousness, we're full of it, you know? And, and she was shocked, but he said, yes, of course we are. We're selfish as can be, and we, we've got to get over this. And, of course, we know that systematic benevolence starves covetous to death, don't we? But I think about David Livingston. I, I saw recently a list of the 100 greatest Britons. 100 greatest Britons. At the top was Winston Churchill. But way down, I don't know, somewhere around 70th or somewhere, they had David Livingston. I thought, how can they have Livingston so low? They have John Lennon, like, number eight, and Paul McCartney at 15th or something like that. Crazy. David Livingston was one of the greatest of the British people. He spent years of his life in Africa, and he did that because of his love for the Savior. Always oh, another tribe, another place to go to share Christ. That same love, when we understand it, will cause us, it will cause us to care with tears and prayer, like it did Livingston. Tears help us. Tears help us at times to... Um, and I don't think I pro progressed a slide here, but, you know, in 2 Corinthians 5.14, let me just pause here. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Christ died for every one of us. And it's his love that should constrain us and propel us ahead. 
But tears help us too. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 4, the, the, the wise man says that there's a time for many things. He says there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. But he says among that there's a time to weep. I was talking with a relative of mine recently whose family has went through some tragic, really sorrowful situations. And, and as I was talking with my cousin, he was just sobbing. And he's a big guy. I mean, he's a really big guy, full of muscle, and just sobbing. And I said, you know, it's okay, weep. The Bible says that we can weep. And it further also says in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. But friends, we can't hardly weep with others who weep if we can't enter into their sorrows. I read a story about a little girl. Her name was Jane. And uh, she came into her house and told her mother that her friend Susie had dropped her little doll baby and had broken it. And, and, she, and the mother said, well, did you help her uh, fix it? And, and, uh, and, and, and Janie said, no, I, I couldn't fix it, but I helped her because I cried with her. I cried with her and helped her. She wept with those who wept. Well, it's been said that others don't, know how much, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And we, it's true, we can't fix the lives of others of ourselves, and we'll never fix them. Only Christ can do that. But we can enter into their sufferings with them and help them in that way. If we can see their problems in this light, if we can see their problems as if it happened to me, what if I was in their, their shoes right now? What if I was in their situation? How would I like someone to enter into sympathy and suffering with me? And friends, and when we are able to help bear their problems, the likelihood is that we will, be, we will also be able to help them to know our Heavenly Father and His Son. It is said that um, when W.C. Fields was dying, he was reading the Bible. Now, if you know anything about W.C. Fields, you know he was a pretty godless man. And someone saw this and they knew this was very out of character. And he said, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for loopholes. I'm looking for loopholes. Well, friends, God's not interested in people who are looking for loopholes. He's not interested in people who don't want the genuine experience. But the genuine experience is an experience of the heart that touches people. I also read a story about a woman that was dying one time. She had some disease and she was very ill. And different Christian workers tried to help her, tried to you know, encourage her to give her life to Jesus, and they didn't uh, seem to be able to help. But there was a woman who really had an intense burden for this woman. She went to see her, and, and she stood by this poor creature of, of sickness and illness and near death, and, 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 and her heart just welled up with tears, and her tears streamed down her cheek, and one fell upon the cheek of this woman. And because of that, the woman's heart was softened. And she accepted Christ as her Savior. What all the rhetoric that others had given her couldn't do. One tear touched her life and made the difference. If we want to win souls, we need to ask God to give us a heart to enter into those people's hearts. And as it says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Have you ever heard it said that uh, something like this, someone gets upset with someone there say, I'm going to put them in their place. Have you ever heard that expression? I'm going to put someone in their place. You know, instead of putting our fellow human being in their place, let's try to put ourselves in their place and try to help that person. One of the most touching anecdotes I ever heard was a story about a man who wanted his shoes to be shined one day. So he went to a little shine boy and he um, wanted his shoes to be shined. And so after a while, he, the, the man thought that the job should be done. He looked down and his shoes were just in a worse mess than when he had started. And there's this little boy trying to clean his shoes up and make them nice. And 
this man, he spoke very sharply to this little boy, you know, and berated him. And the little fellow looked up, and he had just a face that was wet with tears. And he said, I'm sorry, sir, but my mother died this morning. I'm trying to make a little money to buy some flowers to put on her coffin. You know, we don't know sometimes. We just don't know the load that our brother or sister, our neighbor, our friend, our relatives are carrying. We see them sometimes and they look like they're okay. But we don't know what's going on in their hearts. We don't know the crown of thorns that they may be wearing upon their hearts and the burdens that they bear. And I'm just pre pleading with God to save me. To save me from the coldness of heart that I have. And to have a, a heart that's warm and gentle. And that can that can not only sympathize, but where possible, empathize with the heartbreak of others. In Testimonies, Volume 4, and page 528 in paragraph 2, we read here that, As the Son of Man, he prayed to the Father, showing that human nature requires all the divine support which man can obtain, that he may be braced for duty and prepared for trial. As the Prince of Life, he had power with God and prevailed for his people. This Savior, who prayed for those who felt no need of prayer and wept for those who felt no need of tears, is now before the throne to receive and present to his Father the petitions of those for whom he prayed on earth. The example of Christ is for us to follow. And that was an example of prayer and yes, an example of tears as well. I mentioned to you earlier that William Miller had quite a burden for the souls of people and could, could speak great, strong, powerful appeals to the people. I'd like to read you, before we close, a couple paragraphs of one of his appeals. He's speaking here and he says, But you, my impenitent friend, who have never wept, nor confessed your sins to God, who have been more anxious to have your names written in the book of fame, of worldly honor, of riches of this world, than in the book of life. Remember, you too will weep when all heaven is silent, when the last seal is broken. Then you will see the book and your name blotted out. Then you will weep and say, once my name was there, I had a day of probation. Life was pro-offered, but I hated instruction. I despised reproof, and my part is taken from the book of life. Farewell, happiness. Farewell, hope. Amen. And then, also from Miller's Works, Volume 2, um, page 174.2, that last reference is... Um, William Miller's Works, Volume 2, page 189.2. He says, be warned. And friends, these words that I read from Miller today are my words for you also. Be warned. Repent. Fly. Fly for succor to the ark of God, to Jesus Christ, the Lamb that once was slain, that you might live, for he is worthy to receive all honor, power, and glory. Believe, and you shall live. Obey his word, his spirit, his calls, his invitations. There is no time for delay. Put it not off. I beg of you. No, not for a moment. Do you want to join the heavenly choir and sing the new song? Then come in God's appointed way. Repent. Do you want a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens? Then join in heart and soul this happy people whose God is the Lord. Do you want an interest in the new Jerusalem, the beloved city? Then set your face as a flint, Zionward. Become a pilgrim in the good old way. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, says Christ, and then all these things shall be added unto you. I like this part where he says, I beg of you, no, not for a moment. Delay not for a moment. The famous evangelist D.L. Moody, he said the greatest mistake he ever did was making a call and he's told the people, he gave, he gave those people one week, one week to consider Christ. You know, come back next week with your decision to consider Christ. And you know what happened that night? The Chicago fire started. And hundreds of people perished. Perhaps people that Moody had preached to. 
This is the greatest mistake you ever made. You would never again tell people to think about Christ and come back later. He always called for the decision then and now while the Lord is speaking to our hearts. And so if there's someone that's hearing my voice today that needs to make their calling election sure, that needs to ensure that their names will be written in the book of Lamb's book of life, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to ask God to give you a new heart, a heart that's soft, a heart that can pray and that can weep. A heart that will dare to care with tears and prayer.